Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify <coughs> your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Glory to God in the highest. And, and peace, peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, King Almighty God, Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. The Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father. every race and nation by the promised gift of your Holy Spirit. Shed abroad this gift throughout the world by the preaching of the gospel that it may reach to the ends of the earth through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. When the day of Pentecost had languages, as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. <clears throat> Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, <clears throat> these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No. This is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. <coughs> In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slave, both men and women, in those days I shall pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us say together Psalm 104, verses 25 through 35, and verse 37. You'll find this in the lesson insert. And it's also in the Book of Common Prayer, pages 735 through 737. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works. Yeah, wisdom you have made 
You're the soul of your creatures. God, the priest, the great and what I see, with his living things too many to number. We creatures both small and great. There they move the ships, and there is that revival, which you have made to support it. All of them look to you, to give them their food and you seize them. You give it to them, they gather it. You open your hand, and they are filled with good things. You hide their face, and they are terrifying. And you take away their breath, and they die and return to their deaths. You send them forth your spirit, and they are created. So, so you renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. And may the Lord rejoice in all his works. He looks at the earth and it trembles. He touches the mountains and it smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will praise my God while I have my being. And if he is the first that please him, I will rejoice in the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Hallelujah. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. <clears throat> We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very Spirit intercedes with signs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is in, in the mind of the Spirit. Because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Jesus said to his disciples, When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me. Yet none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment about sin because they do not believe in me. About righteousness because I am going to the Father, and you will see me no longer. About the judgment, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I have said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. <clears throat> In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. How many of you still take a newspaper at home? About half. Now, some people don't take one at home. You get it in, online on your computer. So you don't have that ritual if you don't get a paper at home delivered at the end of your driveway. You don't have that making the coffee, going outside, walking down the driveway, and picking up the newspaper, taking it out of plastic, and seeing what the headlines are. Um, you probably miss that little ritual if you don't get the paper at home, but uh, there are advantages to getting it online. I completely understand that. We get the weekend paper, Saturday, Sunday, oh, Friday also, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, but no, we don't get the rest of it. And this has crosswords in it. And I like to read the local news occasionally, but my wife really does, and she finds the articles I need to read. This time, though, <laughs> yeah, she's a great help. I mean, I don't like to read the newspaper that much, but I tell you what, yesterday, I got up really early, as I did every day last week, made the coffee, I even took a cup with me outside, walked down the driveway, picked up the paper, opened it up, and I was coming inside and I was thinking, wait a minute, this can't be real. Uh, I saw something in the paper that seemed like it, it could have been a mock-up newspaper that somebody would have made up to try to play a joke on me, because one of the headlines, I just, it couldn't be true, it's too good. See, I'm used to bad news. <clears throat> Are you used to bad news? <clears throat> I'm pretty used to bad news. And I live with a, with a wonderful woman to whom I have been, will have been married 37 years if we make it to Wednesday. <laughs> and I hope we do. Oh, she's great. I just, I just love her more and more. But she watches a lot of news, and sometimes I have to beg that we turn it off the news and go to something else if we're going to be together. I can always go upstairs and watch tennis. She, she leaves me free to do that anytime I want, even with dinner. It doesn't matter. <laughs> well, I'm just playing, but I'm, it's probably true. 
<laughs> so I'm used to the news on TV and, and we just had a session, the clergy had a session with a counselor who was telling us how, uh, something we probably already knew, but uh, the news media and journalists, they know that bad news sells. And so they, if they get a bad story, they like to burst the public in it. It draws the attention, doesn't it? And uh, so bad news sells. So I'm used to bad news. We've had some bad news last year, in the past year and a half. Of course, we have some bad news every year. Even last week, I wasn't that surprised to read about uh, major pipeline being shut down through a foreign pirate hacking our computers. Yeah, that's, that's the kind of thing I'm used to. And then um, I was a little, I raised an eyebrow when I read that the I-40 bridge connecting Memphis and West Memphis, connecting the Eastern United States with the Western United States had been damaged. There was a crack in that bridge, which rendered the bridge unsafe for cars to travel over it and for barges to go under it. It's just like we were shut down by a military strike. I couldn't, well, I couldn't believe that. I was about to say I couldn't believe it. That was pretty serious though. And I was thinking, hmm, I want to know more about this. See how interested I am in bad news. <laughs> yeah, but this sermon is not supposed to be mainly about bad news. It's about good news that's so good, it's almost hard to believe it. So I'm gonna move on from that, if you don't mind. Um, but see, when I woke up and I went out and got that paper and I opened it up, I couldn't believe it because I was reading that the Tennessee Department of Human Services, the commissioner, Clarence Carter, was as giddy as a seven-year-old child on Christmas morning because $700 million that has been sitting in a pile somewhere maybe in an offshore account, I don't know, but it's been sitting in a pile waiting for Tennessee to give to needy families. And uh, through some excessive patience, perhaps, of government officials, I don't know what it was. You could probably tell me some bad news about the reason why it wasn't being spent. Um, but uh, it wasn't being used for needy families. And I, I was thinking that there were some needy families last year in, uh, in the past uh, 18 months and two years in, in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And I looked up the poverty figures. Four and a half percent of Williamson County are in poverty and 14% of Murray County are in poverty. So there's some poverty around here. And, uh, people lost jobs due to the pandemic. People suffered and had medical bills. They weren't able to get medical treatments. A lot of people died. So there could have been a lot of help for needy families uh, given out. And now, somehow, the General Assembly has passed a plan to use the more than $700 million in unused temporary assistance for needy families, federal grants, that had been amassed and unused since 2019. If you have a rebuttal to this sermon, you're welcome to give that to me after our, our uh, congregational meeting, uh, <laughs> which follows this service. Maybe there's more to it that I just don't see, but, but uh, uh, Clarence Carter was smiling big in the picture on the newspaper. And this is like an article that would be in my dream newspaper. If I woke up and somebody wanted to give me a newspaper that had Articles from my dreams, of good dreams, not nightmares. This would be in there. It, it is so, I love to use money. Money is for using for people. I'm pretty good at spending money. Now this has its upside and it has its downside. We won't go into that right now. So when I turned to 7A, page 7A of the Tennessean, to read the second part of the article, uh, which was even better than the first part, I saw a picture of a little girl who was smiling and the headline was girl purposely put slime on would-be kidnapper <laughs> another article too good to be true how could this happen somebody has figured out what i wanted to read in the paper and is 
arranged of history so that these articles would be in the paper on this particular day when I was looking for a sermon about good news. Oh my gosh. Well, I read the story and it's a really serious story. But when I think about sliming somebody, I can't not think of Ghostbusters. <laughs> Try not thinking about Ghostbusters when you hear about somebody being slimed, especially a bad guy. Now, I know Jesus loves that bad guy, and I hope Jesus works his, well, Jesus has made it possible for him to be redeemed, and I, and I hope for his healing um, now that he's been captured, because this girl uh, resisted him. She was 11. Her name is Alyssa in Pensacola, Florida. She resisted him, and she put slime on him. It's blue, because she watches... Um, regularly law and order special victims <clears throat> she knows what to do because she knows the authorities are going to need some evidence and she put evidence all over that man's arm <laughs> and everywhere else she could get it while he had her by the head and had a knife and was dragging her to the car who knows what he was intending but it wasn't good it didn't start well it wasn't good well she tripped him and uh, they both fell down she broke free and she ran home told her mother exactly what happened. The authorities started looking for him and they probably put out an APB looking for a man with blue slime on him because they found him and he had blue slime on him. That's pretty good evidence that he was the one. Well, I thought, what else is in here? I, I can't go on like that forever. We've got to talk about the Bible song. But I will go, but I will go to the Episcopal News Service which is, uh, do you all take email, emails from the Episcopal News Service? Mm -hmm. it, it, it's our, our church's uh, national news service. You can do it, I mean, you just, I think that because we're connected to the diocese, we're automatically connected with that. But anyway, if you want those and need to know how, contact me and I'll certainly show you how. Well, the Episcopal News Service, said that churches were now <clears throat> modifying their COVID protocols in large numbers in many places where they believe it's safe to do this. And they're beginning to gather inside without masks and to have and to sing and to have communion in both kinds. And um, <laughs> this article is just on time because I've worked it out with our mission council that or maybe they worked it out with me that, that we would actually do this today. And I was quite reticent and, and I'm still a little leery of what we're doing. Um, but we've, we've sent out a commu communication to all our members and said if you have any symptoms of anything that could be COVID-19, then please, we encourage you to stay home and attend online. And if you're especially vulnerable for some reason, or have not yet been vaccinated, please wear a mask uh, and, and be careful. But for those who are vaccinated fully, we can proceed with, with worship without masks and with communion. So I say that, and here we are. Well, the Episcopal News Service gave us gave me a little good news because if it's happening all across the Episcopal Church. Well, if it's not a good thing, we'll all go together. <laughs> but I'm thinking, well, <clears throat> I'm not sure I always want to go along with everything that everybody else, even in the church, is doing. So um, I have to think about these things myself. But it's, it's probably good news that perhaps, truly, the 15-month COVID winter is finally thawing. We hope we hope that, but our hope is really in Christ. <laughs> we could be wrong about COVID nineteen. Some new whiz bang strain could be developing right now that could come out and be invulnerable to all the vaccines. We don't know, but uh, we're going to be vigilant about that. But our real hope, our eternal hope, is in Christ. That's what Saint Paul tells us in Romans. We have been experiencing uh, in 
contrast to this bad news that we've had so much, it's overwhelming and possibly addicting, we've had a barrage of good news from the church. And if you come here or turn it on on your computer, you hear news that is so good that it practically breaks the world right open. And Jesus actually says something about that in, his, in the gospel today. Uh, he says that um, <clears throat> the, when the Spirit comes, he will convict the world. Uh, convict the world of, about, about sin, about righteousness, and about judgment. And then he explains a little bit about that. This is by far the hardest verse in that whole gospel. And I said to myself as I was preparing my sermon, I will never talk about that. <laughs> well, guess what the rest of the sermon is about? It's about that verse. Um, but first of all, a quick review of the barrage of good news. Women go to the tomb on Easter Day. There's no body. Stones rolled away, nobody. There's a man, strange man, telling them that he's risen. Later that night, he appears to the disciples, except for Thomas. A week later, even Thomas sees him and is invited to touch his wounds. Never says that he does, but he falls down and he says, My Lord and my God. That is the climax of John's gospel. Thomas declares him to be Lord and God, divine. Such good news that even people who are tough-minded and not just a sucker for any good story that comes their way, but need to see things themselves, even those people can know the risen Christ and believe. Hallelujah. I'm one of those guys. Think. Then, a couple of weeks ago, we hear Jesus praying to the Father, and he says that he's given us, well, he's given the disciples, and by extension, he's given us what the Father gave him to say to his followers, so that, quote, they may have my joy in them, and that their joy may be full. This is what Jesus wants. I know that I came in here and preached on this and spoke in that high voice that sounds kind of weird, I guess. Um, sorry, that's how I learned to talk uh, in my childhood when I'm really emphatic about something. Uh, if Jesus wants this to be a gift that we receive, if he wants his joy that he's had with the Father forever, which is divine joy, if he wants that to be ours forever, well, he did rise from the dead. He might have the power to do anything he wants. I believe, I, put, I trust him a lot more than I trust myself. I want his plan for my joy instead of my plan for my pleasure. <laughs> well, that's, another, that's another sermon entirely. His plan for our joy is the one that comes from the God who sent him for our sakes, who raised him from the dead, and who sent the Holy Spirit upon all flesh. So, this is such great news. This is just such great news that it overcomes the daily news cycle. It overcomes what we're used to reading in the newspapers. It overcomes the crack in the bridge at I-40. It overcomes the hackers making it a little hard for us to get some gasoline. Boy, that, I suffered so much. Excuse me. It was really serious. It could be a lot worse. But I didn't suffer. I didn't, and you might not have either. We could because of something like that. Even if we do suffer through some evil attack by people like that, then we still hope in Christ. He's the one that rose from the dead. So, today, we have 
still greater news. We have news of the gift of the Holy Spirit poured out upon all who hear and believe so, and it's available to all people. Those, those disciples at 9 o'clock in the morning were not drunk. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. And I thought it was a little bit naive for, uh, for Peter to expect everybody to uh, just realize that they couldn't be drunk. Uh, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. Well, I know people can be pretty darn drunk at 9 o'clock in the morning. So, I mean, have you ever been to party weekend at Swanee? Yeah. I lived through four of those. Mercy. <laughs> so, <laughs> it can happen. But <laughs> this great news comes today that God's intention is for us to have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. And that we might proclaim the good news the ends of the earth proclaim good news these great things that have been hitting us at church every Sunday since Easter and if you go through the whole lectionary you will find there's good news every single day certainly every Sunday every Sunday is the celebration of the resurrection that's why we call the Sundays of Lent, Sundays in Lent, because they're like islands of festivity placed in a time of fasting and penance. They're in Lent, but these are Sundays of Easter. So these little words mean a lot in our church. Jesus calls the Holy Spirit another advocate another advocate why would he do that because Jesus is our first advocate he was the one who was for us for us he also calls the Holy Spirit <clears throat> um, in the Greek the word is, is paraclete it can mean comforter it can mean someone who comes alongside us <clears throat> and comforts us and helps us and the spirit is the one who's given to us to guide us into all the truth and into an understanding of the things to come and when Jesus was saying that it's highly likely he was saying the Holy Spirit will give you an understanding of what happens on Good Friday when I'm crucified and of what happens on Easter day when I rise from the dead I'll, the Holy Spirit will give you this understanding. It's better for you if I go away. It's better because you'll have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will be like me. He'll be another advocate. Another advocate. But each person can have that spirit within himself or herself. You don't just have to. You, you're not faced with having to be with Jesus physically or without Jesus completely. The Spirit of Christ is given to us. And so that's how we are given the guide for all of our life. Jesus proclaimed when the Spirit comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness. 31 and 2. Now the judge is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world shall be cast out. Because of the gift of the Holy Spirit, we know what evil is. The Holy Spirit will convict the world about sin. The world has this opportunity to know what sin is. In John's gospel, the world does mean this conspiracy of human beings in rebellion against God, not wanting to submit to God. The world is resisting God. But that world will be convicted of, about and of sin. 
you will be shown what sin really is so that we know there's something terribly wrong when a 30 year old man tries to drag an 11 year old girl into a van using a knife and we know there's something really great when that little girl learned on TV to leave evidence and puts slime all over that guy so he can be caught and brought to justice and perhaps helped. So we rejoice that the Spirit convicts the world about what sin is, what evil is. We know also what righteousness is. The, world, the Spirit will convict the world about righteousness. First, of Jesus. Jesus is the one in the right relationship with God. He's going to the Father. He was raised from the dead. If you want a pretty good example, if you want an example of a perfect man, look at Jesus, what he said, what he did. Think about whether or not somebody could have invented him. I never could have. No. Nobody could have invented Jesus. So he's real. He's true. And so we know what righteousness is. We know what it is to be in the right relationship with God because we have seen Jesus and because the Holy Spirit gives us the insight to understand him and to know what justice and righteousness are. And we even know that even if we are against taxing people so that a whole lot of money can be laid aside to take care of poor people, even if we defend the, the right to property so that we resist tax increases, which I know is a legitimate argument, if money has been set aside for the use of these people, then we know it's in the right relationship with God for that money to be spent for the good of these people. So we rejoice <laughs> when it's when the knots are untied and it seems like that's about to happen. We know that the Holy Spirit convicts the world concerning judgment. Because the ruler of this world, that would be the evil one that Jesus was trying to protect us from. <clears throat> he wanted the Father to protect us from this evil one. Also, he's known as Satan. He's the one who tempted Jesus in the desert at the very beginning before his, before his public ministry. He's the one that went away to return at an opportune time. He didn't really leave Jesus completely alone. Mm -hmm. There were times when people wanted to make him king and he slipped away. That was a temptation. There was a time when Peter said, you can't go to the cross. This is not for you. Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. And Satan also is the accuser. He's the one that says bad things about people. He even says bad news about Jesus. In a very intense movie made years ago called The Passion of the Christ. Um, there was a great scene in which uh, Satan tempted Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. We don't really know what happened in, through Scripture when Jesus, when Jesus, about this sort of thing when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, but he was in an agony. We do know that. And the Satan figure told Jesus, it can never work. You should run away now. You can do good if you just keep yourself alive. If you let them catch you, you're just going to be put on a cross and die. You're just going to be caused to suffer. It's not going to do any good. One man cannot die for everyone and free them from sin. I don't know how you got that idea, but it is crazy, foolish. You're just wasting your life and all the good you can do if you just.